I could talk all day about success in any industry, but I might as well bring up the guy who knows more about it than me. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce this next session, which I'm so excited for you guys. So many of you know already Darren Hardy. And Darren is the publisher and editorial director of the magazines you have sitting in front of you. He's the leader of Success Magazine, and he is a visionary force, this guy, having come in and taken over the magazine and led it in such positive directions in the last few years is like astounding what he's done there to me. I mean, just astounding. He, he sits in the chair at success of Orson Sweat Martin and W. Clement Stone, Napoleon Hill, Og Mandino. Like he holds the chair of legends. And from that chair, you know, he's really been leading this industry, even before he came to Success Magazine, he's been in the industry and leading personal growth for about 17 years now, where he has, you know, developed thousands of television shows based on these per two personal development networks that he led. He has interviewed everybody in the space who's a success, not just in the quote unquote smaller narrow expert field, but the broader global world. Sir Richard Branson, he interviewed Steve Jobs, he's interviewed Lance Armstrong and Colin Powell and Donald Trump and the list goes on and on and on and on and Brendan Burchard and he just really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love this guy, I love this guy. And, and he has really, really done an extraordinary job over there and you know, he's also the author of this new book called The Compound Effect. And my friend David Bach called this book the new Bible of self-improvement. It's so good. And we just found out that this week it hit New York Times and USA Today bestseller this week. With that, an awesome Experts Industry Association welcome from the leader of our field, Success Magazine, Mr. Darren Hardy. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Enjoy this group, huh? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Darren Hardy! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know about yours, but my childhood sucked. <laughs> my parents divorced when I was 18 months old, and my mother didn't want me, so she gave me up to my father. Uh, as a matter of fact, when my mother originally found out that she was pregnant with me, she got mad. And then later when she found out I gave her stretch marks, she got really angry. <laughs> and after I was born, she was generally uh, disinterested. Um, it was kind of an ugly baby, and that might have contributed to it a little bit. <laughs> but luckily for me, um, you know, she was just one of those women who never really wanted to be a mother. And luckily, she admitted that to herself, and she just gave me up to my father. Now, my dad, he was only 24 years of age at the time, so he didn't really know what to do with me either. Uh, he had just moved from the San Francisco Bay Area to what seemed like the middle of nowhere, Albuquerque, New Mexico, to become an underpaid university football coach. And so this was his uh, parenting solution. <laughs> Shove me in the corner of a couch, barricade me with pillows, and put headphones on my head. That stunned look was the look I had for most of my childhood. <laughs> he was pretty neglectful, too. You can see, you kind of had to fend for yourself. <laughs> to say that my dad wasn't exactly the nurturing type is a dramatic overstatement that is comical into itself. Uh, my dad was a muscle-bound, aggressive, alpha male. Uh, that we affectionately called around the house as a bit Neanderthal. And if you've never seen a, a Neanderthal, this is what one looks like. <laughs> and my father, he parented like he coached football. So there was no whining, no excuses, no blaming, lots of yelling and screaming and lots of cursing. As a matter of fact, uh, do you remember the movie Full Metal Jacket? <laughs> I was raised by Sergeant Gunnery. <laughs> And my dad was, was famous for one of uh, his coaching philosophies, and that was no matter how hurt a player got on the field, they were not allowed to come out of the game. In one game, this linebacker wobbled to the sideline and begged to be taken out of the game, and my father yelled, not unless you're showing bone. And he pulled back his shoulder pad, and out was sticking his collarbone like through his neck skin like a Thanksgiving turkey. 
So whenever uh, any of us kids want, needed to stay home from school because we were really sick, we would say, Dad, Dad, can we stay home from school? And he would yell from the other room, not unless you're showing bone. So we'd pick ourselves up and, and go to school. So m the other thing that happened is when, my, uh, when I was four years old, my uh, father married my step monster. <laughs> and uh, I did not mispronounce that. And she... Uh, because she was jealous of my relationship with my father, she, was, she had two other children with him. She did everything she possibly could to ostracize me from the family. I was literally the redheaded stepchild. And you could see that my father also cut my hair. So this dysfunctional childhood is the reason why I'm the functional achiever that I am today. Uh, let me explain. It is because of going through these abandonment issues is the reason why I'm vigorously self-reliant. Because I was raised by Sergeant Gunnery is the reason why I'm also very self-motivated. Uh, because I had to achieve in order to earn his respect and his love and his attention is the reason why I'm so motivated, goal-oriented, and results-driven. And a lot of times I think people, uh, they look at their childhood as, as wounds. And I say it is your adversity that is your advantage. That having gone through difficulty is like to your emotional and psychic body is like working out a muscle. The way you work out a muscle is that you put stress on it. You create pain. And while you are actually doing this repetition, you are destroying the muscle. You're tearing the fibers. And in rest, it grows back bigger than it was before. And so I guess the first message that I want to give to you is that I, I hope that your childhood sucked too. <laughs> because that means you have developed the muscles it's going to take for you to achieve what normal mortals cannot achieve because they have not had the opportunity to develop the muscles that gives them that strength and that vigor. So turn your adversity into an advantage and stop looking at whatever happened to your, in your childhood as wounds and look at them as the muscles that you have developed for you to do the superhuman things that you're going to go out into the marketplace and do. So what I'm here to do is to answer the four questions. Brendan sent out an email when he said, here's what we want you to talk about. And it's basically answer these four questions. How have I developed my message? How have I developed my skills? How have I developed my brand? And any other tidbits of advice? So that's basically the framework of what I'm going to give you over the next several minutes, very directly. So the first one is, how did I discover my message? If I were to ask you, what is the most powerful machine in our entire society, the most prolific and powerful machine ever created by man in our society, what would it be? A machine. Here's what it is. It's the television. The television is the most powerful machine in our society. We even orient our entire living rooms around it. We orient our family around the centerpiece that is that television. That television is our window to the rest of the world. We identify the world around us and we identify ourselves based on the images and messages that come through that television. We orient our living rooms, we orient our lives, we orient our psychology around that machine. And that machine has been doing awful, ugly, destructive things in our society. Let me tell you what the blood sport, there is what's called a blood sport of competitive media going on in our society. And it is the most destructive influence in our lives. Let me tell you how it came about because it didn't start this way. Once upon a time, there were only three television networks and it was real reporting and they really wanted to tell you what was happening in the world and it was fair and balanced, not a mantra or a slogan, but it was about showing you the rest of the world and three, three TV channels were your only options. Well, now we've got thousands of TV channels for all of you to choose from. 
Beyond that, we also have web television channels for you to choose from. Now there's tens of thousands of options to choose from. On top of that, there used to be just a couple of radio programs that could come in on your dial car radio. Well, now there are thousands of radio stations for you to choose from and tens of thousands of podcasts for you to choose from. Magazines. I mean, walk up to a magazine rack today and it's just unbelievable the number of options you have in the most arc, you know, ridiculous of niche content categories. And then you've got blogs and you've got digital magazines, online magazines and the rest. So here's what's happening. We are being bombarded with options of content and it is continually sort of proliferating your attention span. The, the information overload of options that all of us have in our lives every day is incredible. Media understands this. So how does media, if they are to get your attention amongst all of this competition, how do they get your attention? And trust me, they know you better than you know you. They know your psychology. They know how your brain works. They know your desires. They know your pain. And they know your fears better than you do. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you're in your car and you're, you're, you're running the traffic on the freeway and you're late and you're starting to get upset. What is, it, what is it that's going on that's causing this traffic? It's in the middle of the day. There's no reason for this traffic. And then you get up close enough to where you can see that there was an accident that happened, must have been long ago, because it's been cleared to the side of the road. It's not impending traffic, but it is still crawling at a snail's pace. Why? Rubberneckers, right? People are just slowing down to look at the wreck. Now, all of you people are probably good, you know, Christian people, and you don't want to see anything ugly or heinous or nasty or disastrous. But what happens when you get up and close to that car wreck? You look because you cannot help yourself from looking. It's in your primal nature to look when you pass. Media understands this. But let me give you an alternative example. Let's say off to the side of the road wasn't a car wreck, but off to the side of the road was a beautiful, majestic sunset. What happens to the traffic? <laughs> Just whizzes on by. Nobody's stopping to look. What does that say about our nature? We are more attracted to ugly, heinous, and sensational then we are to beautiful, wonderful, and miraculous. Media understands this. One key point you need to know, your mind is not designed to make you happy. Your mind does not give a crap about your happiness. Your mind's sole job is to keep you alive. It's survival. And so it's constantly on the lookout for danger. It's constantly on the lookout for attack or things that might interrupt your survival. And so when you show it negative, heinous, and ugly, and sensational scenes, it lights up like a Christmas tree. And it's constantly now in, in processing in that worry mode. So this is what's going on in our society. We are being bombarded with media who's trying to drag your attention, knowing that the way to do it is through sensational shocking, lewd, scandalous media, and it's bombarding our brain. And here's how it ends up working. Let me just show you as a physical demonstration so that you remember this as you sort of understand how the brain works. Here, here's your brain, okay? It's an open vessel. It will hold anything you put into it. It'll hold mother's milk, it will hold cyanide. It doesn't filter, it doesn't judge. So, here's what happens. This is negative media. It is filling up your brain with dark, dirty, ugly, nasty messages. Now, your mind can only see the world as dark, dismal, dangerous, and worrisome. Because what you feed it, like a computer, Input, you know, garbage in, garbage out. 
that becomes your view of the world. What do you do about this? Because you are surrounded with it. You are bombarded with it. Well, the one thing you can do, and I'll give you a couple of other things you can do, is you can find clean, clear water. And you will have to go out and seek it because the dirty water will beat a path to your door. And sometimes that dirty water is your own conversation to yourself. But the only thing you can do proactively is seek out positive, wholesome, abundant, prosperity-based cleansing information. And like a dirty glass, if you just pour water and let it overflow and let it overflow, clean, clear water, clean, clear water, you end up with a glass of clean, clear water. You end up with a mind of clean, clear thoughts, clean, clear prosperity, abundance, possibilities. You see the miracle around you. We are living through some of the tumultuous times. The ne media is going to make you think that it's the worst of times. I promise you there has never been more opportune times in human history for the budding entrepreneur than right here, right now. But it becomes difficult to see that possibility because media is constantly filling our mind with negative, dangerous, and worrisome media. So I remember Frank Kern, when I interviewed him uh, for success, uh, he used this analogy, which I thought was great. Here's what it's like. Imagine you had an eight-year-old daughter and you invited somebody over for dinner and you're in the kitchen cooking and they're in the living room with your daughter and you walk in on a conversation and that person is sitting down right in front of your daughter talking about murder, talking about death, talking about tragedy, talking about scandal. What would you do with that guest? Kick them right out of the house and never invite them in. But that guest is sitting in your living room every night, feeding your family. Now your brain, your mind, is like an eight-year-old. It believes whatever you feed it. It doesn't discern between news media halfway around the world and the reality of your personal existence. That's the great tragedy happening in our society. Here's how the creative process works. You get in life your outcomes by what it is that you create. Easy enough, right? We're all creative beings. When you come into this life naked, scared, and ignorant, what you get in life after that is anything you create. So what are you creating? You create what you expect. We've all heard expectation leads to manifestation. So then that begs the question, well, what is it that's driving our expectation? What are we expecting if that's ultimately going to deliver my results? You expect what you think about. And this is why most of the towering personal development books have been focused on this process. Think and grow rich. As a man thinketh. The power of positive thinking. The magic of thinking big. Because this starts the entire creative process. But I'll say there's one step before that. Because how do we possibly control our thoughts? 24-7, 365. What is it that we're thinking about? You're thinking about whatever you put in your ears and in front of your eyes. That's it. So if you're on the way to the office and you're turning on the news media as you're driving in your commute, your brain, which has been lit up by all the danger and scandal, is processing that unconsciously all day. It's driving what you're thinking about. That thinking process is driving your expectation of what's possible in the world, what's possible for you, and that's ultimately what's driving your creative engine to produce the outcomes in your life. Where your attention goes, energy flows. What controls your focus controls your life. When I had the chance to interview Mario Andretti, I asked him the one question that says, what's the number one tip to being a great race car driver? You know what his answer was? Don't look at the wall. I said, what do you mean don't look at the wall? He says, your car will go where your eyes go. Never look at the wall. Interesting enough, I live in San Diego. I was trying to learn how to surf. And one of the first lessons that the surf instructor gave me was point your eyes in the direction you want your board to go because your board will follow your eyes. What's the one thing you never do if you are a tightrope walker? Why? Because your body will follow your eyes. Your body will follow your eyes. 
your life will follow the direction your eyes are pointed. And if it's pointed at negative, sensational, nasty news media, that is the direction you are pointing your life. These are the messages we are surrounded with. This is my fight. This is my message. Instead, I want to show these messages and litter people's mind with what's possible, the abundance, prosperity, and the miracles that surround us every day. Every day, we are presented with the 12 most ugly, heinous, nastiest things that happen in the world. And then it's paraded morning, noon, and night, morning, noon, and night. The same day, millions of wonderful, amazing, miraculous things happen on the same planet. But you never hear about it unless you pick up the pages of Success Magazine. <laughs> so I say, our main message is, through all the ugly, heinous, nasty things that you're surrounded with, there is at least one beacon of hope and opportunity. There's one place where you could see people doing amazing, wonderful, miraculous things, overcoming great odds and still doing life-changing things in the world. And you'll find their example and you'll learn how they do it. And that's what we want to present to you inside the pages of success. So I want to help you find your message. And I want to just want to offer you an alternative view about how to find it, because it's how I found mine. There are two ways to find your message or to find your why. The one is the one everybody is easily familiar with, and that is, what is it that you want? What, what do you like? You know, what are you, what are you fighting for? Okay. That's easy. We talk about that all the time. But here's one that I, th I think a lot of people uh, are, are not so focused on, and that is, what do you hate? What do you hate? Do you hate global warming? Do you hate breast cancer? Do you hate the mistreatment of mammals? Do you hate homelessness? Do you hate injustice? I hate news media. CNN, with my book, they asked me to do an article. Seriously. CNN asked me to do an article. So you know what the title of, of my article was? Is Wolf Blitzer Hurting America? And then I went on and just did this, just this, this killer attack on news media, kind of like what I just did for you here. <laughs> Knowing, I said, if you are truly fair and balanced, you will publish your own criticism. And... If you don't, I will publish it on my blog that you didn't. <laughs> hey, we all need an enemy. We all need an enemy, right? David needed Goliath. Uh, Luke needed Darth Vader. Hey, even God needs Satan. So sometimes the best way to find your message is to figure out what you hate and what you want to fight against because that might just be the passion that fuels you. Lance Armstrong, who I think is a hum uh, an amazing human being, I don't give a crap if he took drugs because they're all taking drugs. He still kicked everybody's ass on a bike. Yeah. But he, he, you know, he participated in the Tour de France before he got cancer, and he was mediocre at best. It wasn't until he had to fight cancer, and then he had that fight that he ended up becoming an unbelievable world champion. Let me show you this uh, quick little video. The critics say I'm arrogant. A doper. Washed up. A fraud. That I couldn't let it go. They can say whatever they want. I'm not back on my bike. For them. How to become a world champion?
the kind of suffering you do on a bike, you better be wanting to kill something. And he wanted to kill cancer. And uh, that's how you find that kind of power. So I ask you, does your why make you cry? I mean, is it so powerful? And is it so painful that it makes you cry? Martin Luther King said, if you, don't, if you haven't found something that you're willing to die for, you aren't fit to live. So I'm curious here about this room. Is your message focused on what you love or what you love to hate or fight? How many people uh, is on what you love? Okay, interesting. How many people on what you love to hate or fight? Ah, interesting, fantastic, good for you. Of course it is, because if you, if you hate uh, the imbalance of uh, equality in the workplace for women, that means you also love empowering women. But like for me, do I love personal development and do I love success? Of course, but I actually hate watching the destructive force of negative news media even more. So it just depends on what, kind, what, what really gets your goat. And it doesn't matter. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to come from that place. I'm a, I'm a competitive person, so I, I, I like to fight. In my book, when I wrote the book, the first thing I did in the introduction was to define my fight because then I could write the rest of the book. But if I had no fight, it, uh, eh, it's no big deal. So I suggest test them both out. Take yourself through both sets of the process and figure out which one it is for you, and certainly it could be both. So let me talk to you next about how, to develop, how I develop my skills. Here's the, what I see as the great gap between the haves and the have-nots, and it will get wider and wider and wider. The path to the American dream used to be very simple. Get the highest education, get a good job, climb the ladder, get a pension, get the house with a white picket fence. Easy, 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 no big deal. Well, today, the world is flat. We're all technically connected to each other. Now your competition isn't the business down the street. It isn't your local chamber of commerce. It's every chamber of commerce in the world as well as every second bedroom and basement occupied by a teenager and a laptop. They're all your competition. That has set up this epic opportunity of uh, 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 better than ever in human history. It has also created epic competition. So it is not going to be your academic degree, and it's certainly not going to be your corporate training that's going to give you the advantage. It is going to be your ever-developing and evolving skills, your emotional resilience, your ability to adapt to change, your ability to present, your ability to communicate, your ability to network, your ability to, to develop personal brand. I'm talking to the choir because you're here. But at the same time, this is the great divide. Few people will have the ability to proactively go out and develop their skills, and so the have-nots will get bigger but the haves will also get bigger and the, the bridge between that gap is a skills gap. So let me tell you the uh, a philosophy that I learned very early on um, when I was 18 years old. Somebody said, here's how you wanna structure your financial life. It's a 10-10 plan. So you wanna take the first 10% of any money you make and you wanna give it back to help others. We've all heard that, right? Tithe 10% to help others. But this is the other key point. You want to take the other 10% and you want to tithe it to yourself. You want to use 10% of every dollar you make and reinvest it in your own personal development. Now, when I made $150,000 a year as an 18-year-old, 15,000, no big deal. You make a half a million, 50,000, you make a million, 100,000, you know, make several million. It becomes more and more difficult to spend that kind of money. However, interestingly enough, the top CEOs, the top athletes, the Olympic champions, they all have the highest paid coaches they can find. Why? Because they know that that is the separating factor to them going on and becoming world champions. So take 10%, this is how you fund your skill development. 10% of all your income goes back into reinvesting in your own personal development. Brian Tracy, uh, very early on when I was still a teenager, I learned this from him. He said, for every dollar you invest in your personal development, it adds at least $30 to your bottom line. Now, where can you go get a 3,000% ROI anywhere in the financial markets today? Where can you get a 300%? Where can you get a 30%? So, Instead of putting in your 401k, instead of putting it into the savings account or buying equities or stocks, trust me, the best investment you possibly can make for your economic future, for your retirement plan, is to invest it in your own evolving personal development. So 
We talked, about the, we talked about the mind, and let me just give you two things to just always run it through. There are two things you need to do with your mind. There's an old Cherokee tale. Uh, grandfather's talking to his grandson, and he says, Grandson, inside each of us are two wolves, and they are at war with each other. And one wolf is a bad wolf. It's angry, it's fearful, it's nasty, it's lazy. And then there is a good wolf, and it is giving and loving and abundant and disciplined. And the grandchild looks up at the grandfather and says, well, well which wolf is going to win? And the grandfather smiles and said, whichever you feed. Inside each of us is a bad wolf and a good wolf. Anything you see on news media, any heinous act you see other human beings doing to the world or to each other, inside each of us lies that potentiality. Everything you see is a part of your nature as well. But what gets demonstrated determines what's been fed. My mentor, Jim Rohn, said, you got to take the worst of your nature and drive it into a small corner. And you got to take the best of our nature and you need to build it and embolden it and make it and, and grow it. And so realize at all times you are feeding one of these two wolves inside of you. And the one that will win is the one that you feed the most. So number one is protect your mind. Go like this with your mind as much as possible. I personally do not ever listen to any news media at all whatsoever. I know that some people think that's crazy and it makes you ignorant and all the rest of that crap. I seem to be doing pretty good. <laughs> I am really cognizant that inside is an eight-year-old brain and I do not want it subject to just whatever news media wants to fill it. Now, I just suggest for you, go on a news media diet. If you need to figure out what's going on for 20 minutes, be very selective, fine, but protect it vigilantly because it will be the path to your door. I mean, I can't walk through an airport without Wolf Blitzer being on and he's throwing the situation room. The world's coming to, the, to an end. Every freaking five minutes, the world's coming to an end. So number one is protect it. And then number two is to feed it. Number two is to find as much clean, clear water as you possibly can flush through it on an ongoing and regular basis. And so I consider the feeding of my mind like a race. And it's a race between everybody else in the world. How often and how abundantly can I feed my mind positive and instructional and inspiring messages? And so I suggest every time you are driving in your car, my car does not move without gas or some sort of instructional CD going. Some CDs I've li listened to 60, 80 times. The, the uh, uh, Challenge to Succeed by Jim Rohn, I've listened to that thing 80 times by now. Same thing over and over again. I'm not even really listening to the message, but it's elevating my mind anyway. So while you exercise or work out, is a great time, feed the mind, feed the mind. While you walk the dogs, is a great time to feed your mind. Now, if you're lazy, you can walk the dogs like this as long as you've got your personal development on. <laughs> really lazy, make the damn dog drive itself. You sit in the passenger seat, make sure you're feeding your mind. Brian Tracy also taught me this E to E ratio. What separates the 5% who are wealthy and the 95% who are not? The 95% spend their spare time on entertainment. The 5% spend the majority of their spare time on education. This is the great divide between the haves and the have-nots. How are you spending your spare time? Now, I'm not saying you don't ever have any entertainment. Of course not. Everything in moderation. But this is the average consumption. Eight hours a day is spent on entertainment. It doesn't always have to be television. Facebook and all that other social crap that's unpurposeful is also entertainment. Chit chats in the hallway, gaming, all the other stuff. It's entertainment. It's fine. Entertainment's okay, but in small doses, certainly not a third of your life every single day. Half your life, if you consider a th one third, is at, at sleep. Don't do that. So, curious, here we are in a high minded room, but just be honest. How much personal development training are you doing each and every day, consistently without fail? A rounding error of zero. Anybody at zero? That would be not the right room. <laughs> Less than 20 minutes, okay? 20 to 60 minutes, fair enough, good. Thank you for being honest. More than an hour, okay, wow, just definitely a different room than you normally are talking to, I'll tell you that. So, fantastic for you, obviously, fantastic for you. 
So let's talk about developing your skills. Here, just give you my, my personal plan, okay? I'm trying to give you some framework and some context about the systems I use. One of the things I see as an epidemic within our learning process is that we're learning a lot all the time. We're constantly feeding ourselves you know, new information, but we study very little. We're always looking for the next new information, but we don't stop to take the information we learn and then to go deep with it to create study. So I want to give you my 1153130035 one, one, plan. <laughs> it's kind of catchy, huh? I was listening to Brennan yesterday. He said you have to have a sequence. Well, that's my sequence. So let me, show you, let me show you the sequence. Number one is take your number one goal, whatever your number one goal is, okay? What is the one skill that is going to determine the most to you accomplishing that goal? So let's say in the expert space, it might be learning how to write really great, or it could be learning how to present, or it could be learning internet marketing. Whatever the way you think the one, the most important skill is to accomplishing your goal, identify it. And then next, take five books on the topic and go immediately to Amazon and order them. This is what I do. I pick the, go, pick the skill, buy five books, go buy three DVD or CD programs, and then pick one seminar and go to it on that skill. One time for me, it was relationships. My number one goal was creating more intimacy in my marriage. So I bought the top five books, I bought the top three CD and DVD programs, and I went to a seminar. And then this is how you consume it. It's a lot easier than you think. It's my 30-30 plan. In the morning, when I first get up, first thing I do, put my iPhone on 30 minutes, and I just read for 30 minutes. I'm going to get through those five books over a period of a month or two. And then I listen to the instructional audio for 30 minutes each day while I'm driving around, working out, or walking the dogs. That's it. That's my personal development plan. The reason why you create extraordinary results is the consistency of that small discipline compounded over time. Oh, I got a chance to weave that in. <laughs> That's it, simple as that. And then this is the five-step study program that I go through. As I'm going through that material, I'm studying that material focusing on that one skill. Then I'm extracting the three best ideas. I mean, it could be a 300-page book, but I'm only looking for three ideas because if there are 100 ideas, there are no ideas. So just get three. You can put it back on the shelf. You go back to it four months from now and get another three, but just isolate it to three. See, again, we're so overwhelmed with so much that we pay attention to so little. So you've got to will it down to the, to the little. Number three is act. I implement one idea right now, this week. As soon as I get the idea, right now, this week, and I practice it. And then I measure the improvement over a period of 30 days. And then I do this plan do review, where I review it, I adjust, and I do it again. And then I review it, and I adjust, and I do it again, until I've mastered the three skills of each of those five books, those three CD programs, and that one seminar. And at the end of 90 days, your skill development and that one skill that's most important to your one goal is unbelievable. People don't do that. They just, they come to seminars, they collect notes, they put the, the notes in a drawer and that's, they think that they're empowered. You're not empowered until you've created an implementation and an integration program that you're constantly reviewing and adjusting and reiterating on. By the way, I see a lot of you writing furiously. I get asked this all the time. There's 120 some odd slides here. If you want to just get this entire slide deck, all you have to do is text your name and email address to that phone number. And it will send you the instructions to download the whole slide deck. Is that helpful? Yes. Okay, I know. I, I see a lot of you writing feverishly down. I want you to actually listen for the key ideas and know that you already have the notes that you see on the slides. And you, if you haven't written it down fast enough, it's there in the corner as we go through this. All right, third question is, how do I develop my brand? Talk to you about brand development. So let me ask you a question. If you had the option where a genie popped out of a lantern and he or she gave you the ability to pick one of these four things to be the best in your space at, the very best, which four would you pick? Either the best management and leadership the best margins in your space, the best marketing in your space, or the best product and solution in your space. 
If you had a chance to pick any one of these four to be the very best, which would you pick? How many people would pick management and leadership? Okay, there's no wrong answers here, by the way. How many people would pick margins? Not many CPAs in the room. How many people pick marketing? Okay, how many people would pick the best product and solution? Okay, maybe it was a little bit of a setup. <laughs> so let's say you pick the number one product and solution. Let me just sort of debunk that a little bit. What is the number one restaurant in the world? McDonald's. Do they have the best product? Mm. What is the number one wine in the world? You're right out of Napa Valley of all these fantastic heritage of winemaking and all the rest of that. What's number one? Gallo? It's worse. Franzia. And it comes in a box. What's the number one water? We have all these, you know, Fujis and, you know, you've got Avions, you've got Smart Waters and all these. What's the number one water? Aquafina, Dasani, and Polar Springs, owned by Pepsi, Coca-Cola, and Nestle. Number one waters in the world. Point is, it doesn't have to be the best product or solution to be number one. So those of you that said management, Let's unearth that a little bit. These people had the best talent available in their organizations. Enron, McKinsey and Company, Ocean's 12, a list of actors, totally failed. And then the 2004 United States Olympic basketball team. First time star-studded NBA stars on one team. Do you remember what happened? They came in third. They got beat by Lithuania. <laughs> Not dream team managements. How about margins? Certainly all the CPAs and CFOs would say, I want the biggest margins because with margins you could do everything. Hey, look, if the product doesn't sell, it doesn't matter what the margins are. <laughs> so here's the reality. Like it or not, I don't like it. But here's the reality. I'd rather say the best product and solution, truly. But that's just not how it works. And you just need to know what the reality is so that you can know how to work with it. Success of any product, service, or solution is 10% the quality of the product. 90% marketing. That's why McDonald's, Franzia, Polar Springs, and the rest. It's a good thing for all of us that Steve Wozniak understood this. There's an interesting story out of Walter Isaacson's new book called Steve Jobs that it, there was early in the very beginning process, you know, Steve Wozniak developed the original uh, uh, technology that ended up becoming the basis of the Apple One. And there's a recount of a story between Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Steve Wozniak's father who was a rocket scientist who had no regard for marketing or anybody that wasn't an engineer. And the story is, is that Jerry, Wozniak's father, told Steve, you don't deserve 50% of this budding enterprise. You didn't create anything. It should be all Steve, Wo Steve, Steve Wozniak's. And the story says, Steve, who was still a teenager, started to cry and relented and said, I'll just walk away and let Steve Wozniak run the company. But Woz, as he became known, said, no, 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 no. He was smart enough to realize that he needed Steve Jobs' entrepreneurial drive and marketing mind. And so even at the insistence of his father, they stayed together as a team. So now, I got a chance to spend some time with Steve. We had him on the cover of Success in June of 2010. And over the past few months, we have an issue coming out in February that is focused on marketing. So I wanted to present decode of everything that Apple has done over the last couple of decades what are the half dozen genius points that created the marketing magic of Apple and Steve Jobs? And so after all this, you know, several month research project, I boil it down to a half dozen. Do you want to know what those are? Yes. These would be masterful in developing your own brand as well. So these are the half dozen fundamentals. By the way, this audio, I'll give you the whole audio, whether you subscribe to Success Magazine or not, because it has this whole introduction in it. And then I interview Seth Godin, 
who's amazing on it, and John Maxwell's on the same CD in the magazine as well. Uh, if you text in, I'll just send you the whole digital file of that CD, because I think this group, trying to develop your expert, how to develop a brand, would be great for you. And it will be on, it'll be on newsstands in February 2009, but I think, we, I think it's finished, so I can get it to you in the next couple of weeks. So here's number one, unrelenting focus. The story is, is that when Steve Jobs was kicked out of his own company in 1985, he came back in in 1997. And the one thing that he did was declutter the company. He eliminated 70% of everything they were making inside of Apple and boil it down to only four products. They were involved in all sorts of niche, crazy industries. The, 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 the Mac, in fact, had several uh, dozen iterations because each retailer wanted it configured in a special way. Steve eliminated it, 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 all of that. You get one Mac. That's it. Four products. What that did is it freed up all of this frenzy hysteria so that they could spend time on innovation and quality because they were focused on four. 1997, when he first came back to Apple, they lost $1.2 billion dollars. The next year, the only strategy employed was focus. They made 309 million in profit. One of the most incredible turnarounds of any company in history. They went from 90 days from being insolvent to being the most valued brand in the world. And they focused the credit to focus. This is, uh, when I asked Steve Jobs, in the interview, I said, what are you most proud of what Apple has built and what you have built? And his answer was, I am as proud of what we don't do as I am of what we do. And in the book, he expands further. This is a direct quote from the book. He says, deciding what not to do, particularly with entrepreneurs who have an idea a minute, <laughs> is as important as deciding what to do. It's true for companies and it's true for products. Consider that in your own product development, in your own solutions, in your own business. This is a conversation by one of my colleagues, the editor of Fast Company, was having with a new CEO of Nike, Mark Parker, and he relates a conversation that he had with Steve Jobs when he asked for some advice about how to be a CEO at Nike. I want to play you this quick little interview. You mentioned last night when we were having dinner that when you first got the, the job as CEO, you got a call from Steve Jobs and he offered you some advice. <laughs> Well, he didn't call to offer me advice, but uh, we had worked together on uh, a Nike-Apple collaboration called Nike Plus. So we took what Apple knows, what Nike knows, and you know, brought a new technology to the market. Anyway, long story short, uh, he said, hey, congratulations. It's great. You're going to do a great job. Uh, I said, well, do you have any advice? And he said, no, no, you're, you're, you're great. And then there was a pause, and he goes, well, I do have some advice. He goes, Nike makes some of the best product in the world. I mean, product that you lust after, absolutely beautiful, stunning product. But you also make a lot of crap. He said, just get rid of the crappy stuff and focus on the good stuff. And then I expected a little pause and a laugh, but there was, there was a pause but no laugh at the end. <laughs> yeah. And he was absolutely right. And in fact, that's one of, been, one of my major uh, focal points in terms of my priorities as a as a CEO, and, and even as a designer when I was growing up with the company, is to edit. I mean, we have so many ideas. Nike is an idea factory. So I ask you the same question. What crappy stuff do you need to stop doing so that you could focus on the good stuff? When I asked Warren Buffett, his key to success, his answer was, for every 100 opportunities that I am presented with, I say no 99 times. This is one of the richest men in the world. That's his key to success, saying no. It's a clue. Here's number two to the decoding of the Apple Jobsian marketing magic. Don't sell products. Apple does not sell products. They sell an identity. They sell an image. They sell status. They sell membership. They sell a community. They sell access into a tribe of cool. You know, remember the 1984 commercial? They didn't talk about a product. 
They didn't talk about features. They talked about a revolution. They asked us all to think differently. That was the message they were selling. They weren't selling computers. They weren't selling listening devices. They were selling a culture, a revolution, and an identity. They wanted every time that you saw somebody holding a phone to their ear and it had the Apple logo on it, you were identified as cool. The white earbuds, one of the first innovations to identify the tribe. If you got the white earbuds because everything was black before then, that me meant you had an iPod in your pocket. And that made you part of the tribe. That made you cool. They even did very direct advertisements about, do you want to be the fat, stodgy guy or do you want to be the cool guy? It was an identity. They even, you can't read that, described exactly how an Apple cool person dresses. <laughs> Identified it in an ad. They're selling an identity. They're selling a culture. They're selling a status. Not selling computers and listening devices. In fact, when you have your Apple computer, when you close the lid, the Apple's upside down. Why is it upside down? So that when it's up, it's showing the rest of the world your Apple. And it's glowing. And that ends up becoming your status symbol to the world because you're in front of an Apple. And Apple is getting free advertising by your wanting to show cool. So what are you selling? Are you selling a book? Are you selling a CD or a DVD? Are you selling a seminar? Or are you selling an identity, a status, access into an exclusive tribe or a tribe of people identified by this feature and function? Very serious question for you to consider. I write it down as a question and then go and think about it for several weeks. What is it that you're selling? What's the identity? What's the status? What's the image? Speak to that. Number three thing they did, launch events. I know that Jeff thinks that he created the product launch formula, but trust me, Apple and Steve Jobs perfected and initiated the perfect product launch formula. Let me just give you a couple of decoding factors about what it is that they do to launch products. The first thing is it starts way before the product ever launches. They create this incredible rumor mill, you know, that you don't think they're involved in and they're mad. Oh, our patents got revealed or, you know, this person's talking about it. Oh, no, no, they're feeding that. They're seeding that. What they're doing is they're creating a pent up desire, curiosity, the need to know. They're feeding that rumor mill. Then they have the big bang event. Most technology companies would go to uh, the big computer show and launch their products. Apple said, no, 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 we're doing our own events called Macworld, even to compete against some of those. And that's where we will launch our new products. And they became a sensational hit. And of course, they had the grandmaster of them all who did the product demonstration and perfected the product demo, the product launch announcement. And if you want to decode that, a good book I recommend is from Carmine Gallo, How to Give Insanely Great Presentations Like Steve Jobs. Excellent book for those that do presentations. So that's another element. And then here's what they did, is they synced the rest of their internal systems to combust exactly at the same time. So when they launch a new product, their website homepage is nothing but the introduction of that product. And then they have pages all set up to explain that product so that they are controlling the message. They're controlling the education behind what their product is. And that hits the moment they say, Steve announces it on stage, the websites turn and there's a front page and then there's education pages to properly educate the marketplace about what it really is. Interesting point. Then they flip over their stores exactly at the same time. When it's announced, all the frontage of their stores changes over simultaneously. This is all internal launching. And then 
at the same time, the external launch hits like a bang. And they come out and you see some amazingly creative outdoor external marketing that launches exactly at the same time. So ask yourself for your business, what is your shock and awe launch plan? What are all the components? It's important to pay attention to all the points, internally and externally, and that it's coordinated to all hit at the same time. So that people, when they first hear it, they don't just hear it one place, all of a sudden they see it and hear it and see it and hear it all at once. And that external and internal validation says, I've got to get in on what this thing is all about. And they line up at the stores. Here's number four a very simple and memorable message. There's so much mastery in this and it would take three day workshop just to talk about how they're able to deuce down the technical uh, majesty that they created their products, but then it just gets boiled down to a single sentence. And then that single sentence is so crisp that the media repeats their marketing message. So a thousand songs in your pocket or there's an app for that or the computer for the rest of us. Even though there's all sorts of amazing features, they just restrict themselves to a single sentence. Very, very important when you consider your own message. So what is your hook? Work on this. This is more important than all the features of your product. That one sentence that describes it, that is the hook that makes it memorable and simple as a brand description. Here's number five. Go one step further. Whenever you think you've got a great product and a great service, go one step further. And that's what Apple always did with their packaging. You already bought the product. They don't need to spend a bunch of money on packaging. But why do they do it? Because when you get it, it looks like a museum piece. You want to keep the packaging. And you put it on your shelf because it's beautiful. When do you keep packaging? <laughs> Only apples because it's beautiful. What does that do? It makes an indelible impression. It's one step further. And I'll talk about in the next point, they believe that the customer relationship starts after you buy, not before you buy. And so they go one step further and they put in this little fingertips thing. They spend money on things they shouldn't spend money on. I mean, the, uh, the CFOs would, would not allow them to spend money on these things, but they do it because it's one step further. That's why we all love them because we're constantly delighted and surprised. Where can you put delight and surprise going one step further in your process? Here's number six. They create a great service impression. One of the things that I learned from Apple's and Steve's philosophy is you don't have to have the best customer service. It's a key point because it's really expensive and very exhausting to have the best customer service, but you can have the best service impression. Here's the difference. Consistency of every impression. You walk into the store, they're all wearing the same shirts. The products all look the same. The packaging all looks the same. The website looks the same. The communications come out of the company. There's a consistency of the, of, of the impression. The whole universe is very harmonious and consistent. What I not, don't see in a lot of businesses is that consistency. So ask yourself the question and do this. Chart out every impression that you have with the outside world. Emails, websites, announcements, package, packaging slips, I mean, just go through the list. Try out every single thing the world ever sees about you and make sure that it's consistent so that when they enter your universe, there's comfort. Number two, innovate, and this is what they did brilliantly, innovate to turn every customer disappointment into a wow. So every time a customer is disappointed in Apple, that is when they ignite trying to do something of wow because that's what makes the biggest impression not the best service, the best impression. So you turn a disappointment, that's when you go into wow. And then they're constantly working on themselves to say, what are the half dozen most pain points in our process? Where, where do we get the most problems or the most complaints? And then they innovate to try to fix those and they innovate it with doing something of wow right at those points. And so your experience, even though it might not be perfect, they end up doing one or two things that you go, wow, and now they've got you your impression of their service has been captured. Brilliant. So chart out your most common pain points and make a moment of wow. Oh, here's one we did. Which picture does this guy look better in? The one on the right, right? That's what we thought. So we, that, we photoshopped the one on the left. 
He got all pissed off. David Hanneminer Hansen, he wrote Rework, got all mad and angry, blogged about it and all the rest of that. So we admittedly went up and tried to make a, a moment of disappointment and we made it a moment of wow. We admitted our mistakes. We printed it in the, the publication. Then he came back and goes, wow, I, I, I thought you guys were going to get angry and mad. And it's like, that's really cool that you, the way you guys handled that. So figure out all the times when something happens that's negative and turn it into a positive. All right, other tidbits of advice, which I really do not have. So let me move. Oh, this is the one I get asked all the time. How do I get in success? Or what's my, uh, what's my advice? You're not going to necessarily like it, but I just need to give you the answer. Because we've got to remember, expert in my world is a little different than, than the, the world at large, okay? Because one of our brand promises at success is that we will curate we will vet out the, only the best of the best, la creme of la creme, and then we will decode what they do to have gotten to that status. Success is not where you end up on the way up. Success is where you end up when you have arrived. It's just a standard of editorial that we're focused on. And so my advice always to anybody in the expert space is to do this. Become an expert before espousing expertise. I know that Brendan will teach you, you can research, you can synthesize, you know, and, and that's a different level of advice expertise than the kind of profiling we're doing in success. Okay, so granted, there's a difference. But I always say, go do something extraordinary that other people want to do, but you do it extraordinary, like way above the radar, and then come back and tell, you how, tell us how you did it. That's it. That's the best way. Go do something extraordinary that other people want to do and then come back and tell us how you did it because that's what people want to know. Okay, so I'm going to skip through these and just hit the last point. This is a content monetization wheel. You'll get a lot of that from a lot of these guys too and you'll get it on the slides, but there's take one piece of content and then remonetize it in a variety of different ways. Those are the spindles on the wheel and then how to create a customer ascension funnel. And, you know, obviously, you know, don't have a product, don't have a book or a talk. Create a movement. What's your movement? What are you enrolling people into? What, what is it that, that, what's the tribe that they get access to? What's the cause, the mission, the vision of your purpose, your stated purpose? And it's not talent. A lot of these top thought leaders, authors, speakers, it's not their talent. I promise you, it's, I, I get a chance to interview them all. It's not their talent. Now, they might be talented, but I promise you that talent was developed over excruciating hard work. Michael Jordan said, anybody can have talent, but you have to develop ability, and it's ability that counts. And then learn to love failure, because you're going to fail, and you want to fail because it's the muscles you're developing to do the superhuman, to do the extraordinary. It's that muscle that's gonna get you to become extraordinary above the radar of everybody else. I, uh, at the, I was at the Dav Dallas Mavericks game in a, in a box and um, Michael Jordan was there and I asked him what his key to success was. And I asked that question to most, most everybody. And this was part of his answer. Let me, let me show you how, let me, let me give you his answer in this short little video. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Realize that championship victories are won through failure. Your expertise, your great success, your incredible victory is only going to be through a minefield of failures. Don't just embrace it. Delight in it. Know that every single one of them is a workout that you have just developed greater muscles with. Here's one of the greatest failures in the world. Richard Branson, we talked about it last night. Virgin Cola, Virgin Vodka, Virgin Cosmetics, Virgin Cinemas, Virgin Cars, all great catastrophe failures, public flameouts. But yet this is his motto, screw it, let's do it. <laughs> if you fall flat on your face, pick yourself up and try again. That's why the guy's worth $4 billion and has 400 companies. And then as Eleanor Roosevelt said, do something every day that scares you. 
And the last ingredient that I see in a lot of incredible thought leaders and experts in the space, this is the last attribute I want to give you. It's this unconquerable, unshakable sense of resolve. And so as you leave here on Sunday and you go back to your families and your communities and your neighborhoods, I want you to see whatever this goal of yours is, whatever mission, cause, or area of expertise that you want to own, as we've talked about, as your mountain in life. And you're going to start climbing this mountain. And there are going to be people that come up to you, maybe well-intended people who you, you know, think love you, who are going to say, what are you doing? What do you, who do you think you are? You're no expert. You know, you got a good job. It's safe and secure. You know, you should just get off that damn mountain and be happy that you have a job. And you're going to have to look them in the eye and say, I'm going to the top. And you're going to climb up a little further and there are going to be some other friends or colleagues or peers or people on Facebook that are just like, you, an expert? You're going to make some contacts with some PR people like, no, 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 uh, we're not interested. And you're going to have to look them in the eye and say, I'm going to the top. And you're going to climb up a little further. And you're going to have some embarrassing moments on stage. And you're going to write some things that are going to get rejected. You're going to make proposals to publishers. They're going to say that you're not worthy. And you're going to have to look them in the eye and say, this is my mountain. You're either going to see me waving from the top or laying dead on the side. I am not coming back. And when you have that sense of resolve, (laughs) nothing can stop you. I look forward to seeing all of you waving from the top. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.